Knowledge Products presents Two Treatises of Government by John Locke. In 1644, the celebrated poet and philosopher John Milton stated the fundamental task of political philosophy. Here the great art lies, to discern in what the law is to bid restraint and punishment, and in what things persuasion only is to work. John Locke, several decades later, made a similar point. It is one thing to persuade, another to command. One thing to press with arguments, another with penalties. Behind every law stands the might of government, ready to compel obedience by physical force. On what occasions should this legal coercion be used? What is the legitimate province of laws and their coercive sanctions? The purpose of law, some might think, is to stamp out vice, evil, and sin. In A Letter Concerning Toleration, John Locke opposes this idea. Idolatry, some say, is a sin, and therefore not to be tolerated. But it does not follow that because it is a sin, it ought therefore to be punished by the magistrate. For it does not belong unto the magistrate to make use of his sword in punishing everything that he takes to be a sin against God. Covetousness, uncharitableness, idleness, and many other things are sins by the consent of all men, which yet no man ever said were to be punished by the magistrate. The reason is because they are not prejudicial to other men's rights, nor do they break the public peace of society. According to Locke, the power of government should be used only to protect persons from each other and to keep the peace. Government should not protect the individual from himself. Laws provide as much as is possible, that the goods or health of subjects be not injured by the fraud or violence of others. They do not guard them from the negligence or ill husbandry of the possessors themselves. No man can be forced to be rich or healthful, whether he will or no. Nay, God himself will not save men against their wills. A government established by consent for the protection of natural rights. These are the basic principles of John Locke's political theory. No human law is valid if it contradicts natural law. As Locke says in his two treatises of government, The law of nature stands as an eternal rule to all men, legislators as well as others. The rules that they make for other men's actions must, as well as their own and other men's actions, be conformable to the law of nature, that is, to the will of God, of which that is a declaration. And the fundamental law of nature, being the preservation of mankind, no human sanction can be good or valid against it. Published anonymously in late 1689, two treatises of government consists of two parts. The first treatise was rarely read or reprinted after the 17th century. But the famous second treatise is one of the modern era's most influential books. It has been translated into many languages, including French, German, Italian, Russian, Spanish, Swedish, Norwegian, and Hindi. Thomas Jefferson and others cited the second treatise to support the American Revolution. Frenchmen called on it to justify their revolution of 1789. Indeed, Locke published his two treatises of government to support England's glorious revolution of 1688, which displaced James II from the throne and led to the rule of William and Mary. As Locke says in his preface, I hope these papers are sufficient to establish the throne of our great restorer, our present King William, to make good his title in the consent of the people, which being the only one of all lawful governments he has more fully and clearly than any prince in Christendom, and to justify to the world the people of England, whose love of their just and natural rights, with their resolution to preserve them, saved the nation when it was on the very brink of slavery and ruin. Because of this passage, and because two treatises of government was published after the Glorious Revolution, many commentators assumed Locke wrote the work 
to justify a revolution which had already occurred. In 1960, this view was challenged by Peter Laslett. Professor Laslett, in a painstaking analysis of the text, concluded the two treatises was written between 1679 and 1681, years before the Glorious Revolution, during a political battle known as the Exclusion Crisis. This crisis was an unsuccessful effort by Whigs to prevent the Catholic Duke of York, later King James II, from succeeding to the throne. Professor Laslett's argument found wide acceptance, and it led to dramatic revisions in the traditional view of John Locke. He was no mere armchair philosopher, removed from the rough-and-tumble world of revolutionary politics, who happened to pen a theoretical tract. On the contrary, as we shall see, Locke was embroiled in revolutionary activity for many years. As originally written, Two Treatises of Government was a radical call for revolution, not an after-the-fact justification. In May 1660, 20,000 Londoners watched as Charles II entered London in a triumphal procession. This was the restoration of the Stuart dynasty to the throne of England. Charles II had spent many years in exile after his father, King Charles I, had been executed by parliamentary forces in 1649, following the English Civil War. At the time of the restoration, John Locke was 28 years old and a fellow of Christ Church, the most important college at Oxford University. For a while, Locke thought of studying for the clergy, because this was required for most positions at his college. Five positions did not require this, however, including two in medicine. This is the career Locke decided on. He became a physician, collaborating with Robert Boyle, the father of modern chemistry, and Thomas Sydenham, a pioneer of modern medicine. John Locke was cut from Puritan stock. During the Civil War, his father, a lawyer, had served as captain in the parliamentary cavalry. Nonetheless, when the Restoration came, John, like most of his countrymen, rejoiced. The return of the Stuarts, Locke believed, meant the return of law and order. I find that a general freedom is but a general bondage, that the popular asserters of public liberty are the greatest engrossers of it, too. All the freedom I can wish my country or myself is to enjoy the protection of those laws which the prudence and providence of our ancestors established and the happy return of His Majesty has restored. Locke recalls England's civil war and the rule of Oliver Cromwell, enforced by a standing army. Those turbulent years persuaded him to favor authority over liberty. As for myself, there is no one can have a greater respect and veneration for authority than I. I no sooner perceived myself in the world, but I found myself in a storm which has lasted almost hitherto, and therefore cannot but entertain the approaches of a calm with the greatest joy and satisfaction. And this, methinks, obliges me, both in duty and gratitude, to endeavour the continuance of such a blessing by disposing men's minds to obedience to that government which has brought with it the quiet and settlement which our own giddy folly had put beyond the reach not only of our contrivances, but hopes. The Restoration re-established the Anglican Church as the official state church of England. King Charles was a man with flexible religious beliefs, and he promised liberty of conscience during his reign. But his first parliament, known as the Cavalier Parliament, entertained different ideas. This Parliament sat from 1661 to 1679, and it was dominated by Anglicans, thirsty for revenge against Presbyterians and other nonconformist Protestant sects. This revenge took the form of four acts passed between 1661 and 1665, known collectively as the Clarendon Code. Although not always enforced to the letter, the Clarendon Code imposed severe personal and civil disabilities on nonconformists, that is, Protestants who did not belong to the established Church of England. Today, John Locke is remembered as a champion of religious toleration, so we might expect him to have opposed Parliament's restrictions on religious liberty. 
nothing could be further from the truth. The young Locke defended strong authoritarian government. In the early 1660s, Locke upheld the right of government to regulate indifferent actions, actions not specifically commanded or prohibited by God. The magistrate of every nation, what way soever created, must necessarily have an absolute and arbitrary power over all the indifferent actions of his people. What if the magistrate enacts sinful laws which contradict the commands of God? Even here, Locke argues, the subject is bound to obey outwardly, even if he refuses his inward assent. This is called the doctrine of passive obedience. The young Locke believed passive obedience is essential to social stability. If individuals pick and choose which laws to obey, if subjects do not obey all laws of the sovereign, society will dissolve into an anarchic state of nature. This was the view of John Locke during the early 1660s, while he was at Oxford. Within a few years, his views changed dramatically. From a champion of the Stuart monarchy, religious uniformity, and absolute obedience, Locke evolved into a champion of individual liberty, religious toleration, and the right of revolution. In 1667, Locke wrote a manuscript titled Essay Concerning Toleration, not to be confused with his famous Letter Concerning Toleration, written years later. In this essay, Locke retreats from the authoritarianism of his Oxford days. He defends unlimited liberty in purely speculative opinions, such as belief in the Trinity, purgatory, and so forth. He also defends toleration in the place, time, and manner of worshiping. In matters of faith, Locke says, the civil magistrate is as fallible as the most ordinary subject. And if a ruler forces us to follow a particular religion, he cannot compensate us in an afterlife if his prescribed religion turns out to be false. Can it be reasonable that he that cannot compel me to buy a horse should force me his way to venture the purchase of heaven? That he that cannot in justice prescribe me rules of preserving my health should enjoin me methods of saving my soul? He that cannot choose a wife for me should choose a religion? But if God, which is the point in question, would have men forced to heaven, it must not be by the outward violence of the magistrate on men's bodies, but the inward constraints of his own spirit on their minds, which are not to be wrought on by any human compulsion. What should a subject do if he believes a civil law conflicts with divine law? Years earlier, Locke had counseled passive obedience to evil laws. Now, he abandons this theory in favor of passive resistance, or civil disobedience, as it's known today. A subject, Locke argues, may disobey sinful laws, provided he does not use violence. If the magistrate endeavors to restrain or compel men contrary to the sincere persuasions of their own consciences, they ought to do what their consciences require of them, as far as without violence they can but withal are bound at the same time quietly to submit to the penalty the law inflicts on such disobedience. For by this means they secure to themselves their grand concernment in another world, as disturb not the peace of this, offend not against their allegiance either to God or the King, but give both their due. As he grew older, Locke's views became even more radical. By the time he wrote two treatises of government, Locke believed in the right of violent revolution against tyrannical governments. Between 1661 and 1667, as we have seen, John Locke's views changed dramatically. What caused this transformation? We don't know for certain, but he was probably swayed by one of England's most dynamic and controversial politicians, Anthony Ashley Cooper. Oliver Cromwell described Anthony Ashley Cooper as that little man with three names. The Puritan Cromwell, who thought two names sufficient for any man, didn't trust the diminutive feisty Cooper. 
After the restoration of Charles II, Cooper became Baron Ashley, and later the first Earl of Shaftesbury. To avoid confusion, we shall call him Shaftesbury. Shaftesbury's name has been memorialized in the word cabal, which refers to a small group of secret plotters. In the early 1670s, Shaftesbury, then called Lord Ashley, was one of five advisors to the king. This group was called the Cabal, because the initials of its members happened to spell the word C for Clifford, A for Arlington, B for Buckingham, A for Ashley, later Lord Shaftesbury, and L for Lauderdale. The vision of intrigue conjured up by the word Cabal fits in well with the reality of Restoration England. The politics of this time, described by one historian as a form of gambling, were fraught with uncertainties and dangers. Restoration politics was a game for experts, and Shaftesbury, by all accounts, was an expert. To some, he was an ambitious and unscrupulous politician whose principles shifted with the changing winds of political fortune. The poet John Dryden expressed this view in his satire of Shaftesbury. For close designs and crooked counsels fit, sagacious, bold, and turbulent of wit, restless, unfixed in principles and place, in power unpleased, impatient of disgrace, a fiery soul which, working out its way, fretted the pygmy body to decay and or inform the tenement of clay. To some, Shaftesbury was a principled champion of individual liberty, religious toleration, and the rights of Parliament. John Locke agreed. The good of his country, said Locke of Shaftesbury, was that by which he steered his counsels and actions through the whole course of his life. Lady Massam, a friend of Locke, recalled his admiration for Shaftesbury. Everything in Lord Shaftesbury was natural and had a noble air of freedom, expressive of the character of a mind that abhorred slavery, not because he could not be the master, but because he could not suffer such an indignity to human nature. And these qualities he inspired into all that were about him. In short, Mr. Locke, so long as he lived, remembered with much delight the time he had spent with my Lord Shaftesbury's conversation, and never spoke of his known abilities with esteem only, but even with admiration. Locke met Shaftesbury in the summer of 1666, while Shaftesbury was visiting Oxford. In poor health, Shaftesbury requested a physician, Dr. Thomas, to bring him bottles of mineral water from Astrup in northern Oxfordshire. Unable to comply, Dr. Thomas sent Locke instead. The two men hit it off instantly. In 1667, Shaftesbury invited Locke to become his personal physician. The following year, Shaftesbury became seriously ill from a cyst on his liver. In an age when surgery was indistinguishable from butchery, Locke performed a brilliant operation. He inserted a silver tube to drain the cyst, thereby saving his patient's life. Many years later, the grandson of Shaftesbury commented, After this cure, Mr. Locke grew so much in esteem with my grandfather that as great a man as he had experienced him in physic, he looked upon this but as the least part. He encouraged him to turn his thoughts another way nor would he suffer him to practice physic except in his own family, and as a kindness to some particular friend. With Shaftesbury's encouragement and support, John Locke the physician became John Locke the philosopher, the author of books whose influence is with us still, an essay concerning human understanding, a letter concerning toleration, and two treatises of government. In 1672, Shaftesbury was named Lord Chancellor, England's highest office. Dismissed the following year and imprisoned, he became the leader of opposition to King Charles II and his policies. In 1679, Shaftesbury led the effort in Parliament to exclude James, the Catholic brother of King Charles, from succeeding to the throne of England. It was during this exclusion crisis that Locke wrote his two treatises of government, 
possibly at the behest of Shaftesbury. Many things led up to the exclusion crisis, but two were especially important. One was the extreme fear of Catholicism shared by most Englishmen. The other was an outbreak of anti-Catholic hysteria in 1678 known as the Popish Plot. Let's take a brief look at these factors. From 1667 on, Locke advocated religious toleration. But this was toleration for Protestants only, not for Catholics, or Papists, as their enemies called them. Locke's hostility to Catholics was primarily political, not religious. Locke believed Catholics owed allegiance to a foreign prince, the Pope, and so could never be good English subjects. Locke also shared the belief of many Englishmen that Catholic doctrine condemns religious freedom. Thus, if Catholics were allowed to gain political power, Locke believed they would seek to eradicate Protestantism. As Locke wrote in 1667, As to the Papists, tis certain that several of their dangerous opinions, which are absolutely destructive to all governments but the Popes, ought not to be tolerated in propagating their opinions. And whosoever shall spread or publish any of them, the magistrate is bound to suppress so far as may be sufficient to restrain it. Locke never retreated from this position, a position shared by Shaftesbury and other advocates of religious toleration. Catholicism was regarded in 17th century England rather like communism is regarded in 20th century America. It was dreaded as a vehicle for absolute government and the eradication of individual liberty. English Catholics comprised a small percentage of the population, perhaps 2%, and the vast majority of these were perfectly harmless. When Locke, Shaftesbury, and others envisioned a Catholic menace, they thought of the Catholic hierarchy, especially the Jesuits, who had so successfully spearheaded the Counter-Reformation. And above all, they thought of Catholic France and its monarch, Louis XIV. France, under the rule of Louis XIV, was a model of absolute monarchy, a model that other European monarchs sought to emulate. Louis called himself the Sun King, he was the sun which radiated light to all of France, and around which all of France revolved. A saying attributed to Louis nicely captures his perspective. L'état c'est moi. I am the state. France was also known for its savage persecution of its Calvinist minority, the Huguenots. Popery, absolute monarchy, and persecution of Protestants. These ideas were inextricably linked in the minds of many Englishmen. What would happen if a Catholic became King of England? This prediction by an Englishman in 1680 is typical. They will burn us and damn us. They will take our lands and put monks and friars upon them. Our wives and children must beg. Popular opposition to popery was traditionally expressed on November 5th, Guy Fawkes Day. In 1606, Guy Fawkes, a Catholic, had been executed for conspiring to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Each year, Englishmen commemorated his execution with spectacular Pope-burning processions. During these rowdy demonstrations, the crowd burned an effigy of the Pope, which was stuffed with live cats to make it squeal. Rumors of Catholic plots abounded in 17th century England. A dilly was concocted in 1678 by one Titus Oates, renegade clergyman and all-around scoundrel. Oates testified to a secret popish plot to kill King Charles, give his throne to his Catholic brother James, massacre Protestants, and transform England into a Catholic country. Oates was widely believed, despite his contradictory, implausible evidence, and despite the fact that Charles, the purported victim of the plot, dismissed the whole business as nonsense. The popish plot caused widespread panic throughout England. A flood of pamphlets flowed from the press with lurid titles like A Narrative and Impartial Discovery of the Horrid Popish Plot and The Jesuits' Manner of Consecrating Both the Persons and Weapons Employed for the Murdering of Kings and Princes. The fictitious popish plot led to the execution of 35 Catholics, including Oliver Plunkett, the primate of Ireland. One amusing incident, at least, occurred during this tragic episode. King Charles, renowned for his sexual appetite and prowess, had many mistresses who bore him seventeen children. 
His favorite mistress was Nell Gwynn, a charming and vivacious actress. Nell had had two previous lovers named Charles, so she called Charles II, my Charles III. One day, while riding in her coach, the Protestant Nell was mistaken by onlookers for the Duchess of Portsmouth, the king's Catholic mistress. Nell Gwynn, facing the hostile mob, shouted, Be silent! I am the Protestant whore! The crowd roared its approval. Did Shaftesbury, leader of opposition to the crown, believe in the popish plot? Maybe not, but he adroitly exploited it for political advantage. Then, when a new parliament was called in 1679, Shaftesbury brilliantly orchestrated a grassroots election effort, and he organized the first political party in England's history. Shaftesbury's enemies saddled his party with the derogatory nickname of Whig, after the Whigamores, Presbyterian guerrilla fighters in southwest Scotland. The Whigs, returning kind for kind, labeled their opponents Tories, after Catholic guerrillas who were fighting in the bogs and hills of Ireland. Thus did England's two great political parties acquire their names. Shaftesbury, riding the anti-Catholic bandwagon, led the movement in Parliament to pass a bill which would exclude James, or any other Catholic, from becoming king. Charles retaliated by dissolving Parliament in July 1679. The next Parliament also pressed for an exclusion bill, and it met the same fate. In March 1681, King Charles summoned another Parliament at Oxford, a Tory stronghold. This Parliament, the third in two years, also demanded the exclusion of James, and so was dissolved by Charles after six days. The parliamentary effort to prevent James from becoming king had collapsed. Shaftesbury believed Charles had no intention of calling another parliament. He was right. Charles, aided by French subsidies, was now financially independent. Thus freed of his reliance on parliament for money, Charles refused to call any more parliaments during the remaining four years of his life. After dissolving the Oxford parliament, Charles sought revenge against his enemies. Shaftesbury was charged with high treason and imprisoned in the Tower of London. He was released by a Whig-dominated London jury, but a follower of Shaftesbury, Stephen College, was not so fortunate. College was convicted of high treason by a Tory-dominated Oxford jury and hanged. England was becoming a dangerous place for radical Whigs, including John Locke. His activities were reported to the government by a volunteer spy, Humphrey Prideaux, the librarian of Locke's own college. Locke's comings and goings, Prideaux told the government, were highly suspicious. Where John Locke goes, I cannot by any means learn, all his voyages being so cunningly contrived. Sometimes he will go to some acquaintances of his near the town, and then he will let anybody know where he is. But other times, when I am assured he goes elsewhere, no one knows where he goes, and therefore the other is made use of only for a blind. He hath, in his last sally, been absent at least ten days, where I cannot learn. Last night he returned. And sometimes he himself goes out and leaves his man behind, who shall then be seen in the quadrangle to make people believe his master is at home for he will not let one come to his chamber, and therefore it is not certain when he is there or when he is absent. I fancy there are projects afoot. This Tory spy was correct. There were projects afoot. Shaftesbury, his parliamentary strategy in ruins, was plotting armed insurrection. His plans revolved around the popular, charismatic, and erratic Duke of Monmouth, a bastard son of King Charles. Shaftesbury and his followers wanted the next king to be the Protestant Duke of Monmouth, not the Popish James, Duke of York. Shaftesbury had failed to achieve this by parliamentary methods, so he plotted revolution. Clearly, Locke assisted Shaftesbury in these plans. But when investigating Locke's involvement, we need to remember that Restoration England was an age of informers, double agents, and agitators. Mail was routinely intercepted and opened by the government. Understandably, therefore, Locke and other radicals, wishing to maintain secrecy, used a kind of code when corresponding with each other. Their letters often convey a double meaning, the surface meaning that would not incriminate them if intercepted by government agents, and the true meaning known only to fellow revolutionaries. 
After the Whigs began plotting revolution, Locke filled his letters with this canting language, as it was called. Consider, for example, this apparently innocuous letter by Locke. The child is thriven since we saw it there, but yet your lady has resolved to put it into Nurse Trent's hands tomorrow, who is also come to town with Mr. Hadley to leave him here, and that for these plain reasons. First, because the thriving of the child since your last seeing of it argues some neglect in the nurse before, which the dissatisfaction appeared in you for her not thriving has made her mend sin. Second, tis agreed that Nurse Edling has very little or no milk, and Nurse Trent plenty, to which you must add a third no less considerable, and that is that upon long experience your lady can with more satisfaction and confidence trust Nurse Trent's care than the other, who never gave her so much reason to suspect her neglect in two year as this has been done in three months. This resolution, I hope, will be of good success to the child. Is this an innocent piece of advice about child care? Hardly. The word child refers to the planned revolution, while lady refers to the Duke of Monmouth. Nurse Trent's is Locke's fellow conspirator John Trenchard, and Nurse Edling is one Mr. Edling, another radical Whig. In short, this letter transmits important information. The Duke of Monmouth had decided to back the revolution, and he was calling on John Trenchard to rally men in the West Country, where Trenchard enjoyed plenty of support, or, as the letter says, plenty of milk. Locke knew this support in Western England was vital to the success of the child, that is, the revolution. Shaftesbury's revolution never materialized. It lacked the necessary preparations and support. The government issued another warrant for Shaftesbury's arrest, and he knew he could not hide out indefinitely. Disguising himself as a Presbyterian minister, Shaftesbury fled to Holland in November 1682, where he died shortly thereafter. John Locke had lost his hero and mentor, and like Shaftesbury, Locke himself would soon flee to Holland. Implicated in the famous Rye House plot, the philosopher John Locke became a hunted man a fugitive from the law. The Rye House plot was an alleged conspiracy to assassinate King Charles and his brother James. Charles liked to attend the races in Newmarket, and he sometimes used a road near a sturdy, moated building called Rye House, situated 18 miles outside of London. As informers told the story, Charles and James were to be ambushed from Rye House as they returned from Newmarket in March 1683. The plan was thwarted, however, when a fire in Newmarket caused the royal pair to return a week earlier than expected. We call this an alleged conspiracy because many historians regard it as a myth, a non-event. Other historians disagree. Whether fact or fiction, the Rye House plot cost the Whigs dearly. Several prominent Whigs were among those executed, including Lord Russell and Algernon Sidney, the same Sidney revered a century later by Thomas Jefferson and other Americans as Sidney the Martyr. Another Whig leader, the Earl of Essex, was imprisoned, but he never made it to trial. He was found with his throat cut. The government said he committed suicide. But many Whigs, including John Locke, believed otherwise. The murder of Essex, these radicals argued, proved the government would do anything to crush the opposition. The government suspected Locke of complicity in the Rye House plot, and they kept him under surveillance. A government spy, Sergeant Richard Holloway, believed Locke was trying to hide incriminating papers. It is taken notice of in Oxford that from Mr. Locke's chamber in Christ Church, that was a great confidant, if not secretary, to the late Earl of Shaftesbury, in a clandestine way, several hand baskets of papers are carried to Mr. James Terrell's house at Oakley, 
near Brill in Buckinghamshire, about seven miles from Oxford. Order Mr. Pauling's, the Mercer's house in Oxford. Although Mr. Terrell is the son of a very good man, yet he and Mr. Pauling are reported to be disaffected. It is thought convenient to make a search by a deputy lieutenant at Oakley, but who is lieutenant or deputy of that county, I cannot say. And if you, at the same time, direct a search by our Lord Lieutenant or one of his deputies of Mr. Pauling's, and let the Bishop of Oxford and Vice-Chancellor then search Mr. Locke's chamber, it may conduce to His Majesty's service. Fearing arrest, Locke fled to Western England and then to Holland. Before leaving, he destroyed many of his papers, thereby creating a black hole for historians who wished to investigate what role, if any, he played in the Rye House plot. He sent other papers to his friend and fellow radical Edward Clark with these instructions. You will know how and how far and in what occasions they are to be made use of better than I. What you dislike, you may burn. What papers did Locke leave with Clark? And what papers, if any, did Clark regard as sufficiently dangerous to burn? A plausible answer to both questions is a manuscript copy of Locke's Two Treatises of Government. Locke wrote the early draft of his two treatises during the exclusion crisis, that is, between 1679 and 1681, but he never mentioned this draft in his correspondence. However, beginning in 1681, he did mention a curious manuscript called De Morbo Gallico, that is, the French disease. The English liked to call syphilis the French disease. The French returned the insult by calling it the English disease. Did Locke, the physician, write a book on syphilis? Probably not. As Professor Peter Laslett first suggested, De Morbo Gallico was likely a false title for the manuscript copy of Two Treatises of Government, and a clever one at that. For, in the eyes of Locke, Shaftesbury, and other radical Whigs, there was another French disease, absolute monarchy. This was the political disease attacked by Locke in his two treatises. Professor Laslett's argument, a fascinating piece of detective work, is accepted by many experts. His conclusion may be summarized as follows. In 1683, when Locke fled to Holland, he left behind two manuscript copies of the two treatises. He deposited one copy with his friend Edward Clark, giving him permission to destroy the work if he considered it too dangerous politically. Apparently, Clark exercised this option, and this copy went up in flames. The second copy was left with Mrs. Smithsby, Locke's landlady, but her copy was missing over half its pages. Locke had removed them. Why? Possibly because he regarded the deleted section as too subversive. Of two copies, therefore, only one survived, and it was incomplete. Locke recovered this shortened version sometime after 1687, and, after making revisions, he published it as two treatises of government. This is conjecture, but it is plausible. For as Locke reports in the preface, the book we know as two treatises of government is less than half the book as originally written. Thou hast here the beginning and end of a discourse concerning government. What fate has otherwise disposed of the papers that should have filled up the middle and were more than all the rest is not worthwhile to tell thee. This is the end of side one. Please fast forward and turn over your cassette.